Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, today, in this video, we're gonna be looking at chapter five, early childhood, body and mind. Um, so basically covering the, 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 the physical aspects, the physical changes, both, both physically and mentally, right? What's going on in the brain itself, um, from ages two to six, approximately. There's a little wiggle room on both sides of that, um, as always, but that's, yeah, that's what we're gonna be looking at. Um, so a reminder, as, as always with these, um, listen up for the four random facts. Once the once you watch this lecture, that quiz will pop open that you'll then plug those answers in and you'll be good to go. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the reminders I had for this one. So as always, again, also, actually, as always, again, uh, <laughs> you can also uh, find the PowerPoints on D2L in the same place that you found this video. So uh, in the content there. So let's get started. Uh, all right, hold the PowerPoint, boop, boop. there we go. So slide two, <laughs> chapter five, body changes, part one. Um, so growth patterns are gonna be shifting in this period, right? Uh, there was a ton of growth in the first two years. Like I'm, I'm thankful that that slows down as time goes. Um, otherwise we would literally be like the size of blue whales. Uh, or, you know, we, we double or more our, our weight, um, quadruple in, in many cases in those first couple of years. Uh, we in increased by over a foot in the first two years. Those things begin to slow down in this stage. Um, but there are, some, there are some significant shifts that do continue to occur. So weight and height increase in the relationship between these measurements, measurements change. We continue to grow, gain weight, um, slower pace than we did in the in the first couple of years. Um, we gain height though at a, at a pretty rapid pace in this point, and most of the height comes from uh, increasing the length of our limbs. And you know our body will continue to grow also, but our limbs will significantly change. Um, so your average body mass index or BMI is lower than at any other time in your life. Your height to weight ratio. Um, Children become slimmer as the lower body lengthens. So again, as the legs get longer and longer, we generally will slim down. Uh, and your center of gravity moves from the breastbone down to the belly button. So if you ever watch like a two-year-old or younger, maybe one and a half, let's say, when they're walking, one of the reasons why they toddle when they walk is because the center of gravity is actually up here, um, pretty much right in the middle of their sternum, okay? Uh, as they enter into this stage and their legs lengthen and, and things shift, their center of gravity begins to lower um, down to the belly button approximately. With that shift, we no longer have a tendency to just tip over as easily. The lower your center of gravity, the lower your chances of falling. Um, and so this is a period where, where our bodies are basically getting into a stage where they'll be more in line with what our adult bodies will be as far as where our center of gravity and things like that is. Um, which also allows us to move through our environment much more easily and much more successfully. Um, so, so running and jumping and climbing and all those things become much easier in this period, not just due to experience, but also due to the physiological changes that allow that to happen, right? If we wanted to just like look at like grip strength and stuff, like weight ratio wise to grip strength, like brand new babies are amazing, right? They're brand new born, you can grab their finger, they grab your fingers and you can literally lift them up off the ground um, by there's them holding on, right? Um, that might not be the case as much at this stage, right? They might have a little bit harder time with that initially, um, but with practice, then that that those strengths will also increase. Okay. Um, and this is, I mean, this picture that's here in this on this, uh, you'll also find it on page one fifty eight with the 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 sister helping her little uh, toddler sibling along. This is a, exact, a good example, basically, of these changes or these differences occurring, right? So the, 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 the girl is seven, her sibling is um, one. So you can see the differences between the two. Okay, next slide. Uh, body changes, part one, I'm sorry, part two. I looked at the wrong slide. Um, nutrition. So I'm gonna to begin to sound like a broken record here when we're looking at the biology side of things and it's gonna continue on basically for the rest of your life uh, and through the rest of these different cycles. Uh, there's, there's four main elements that you're gonna to need to basically have a good developed life. One is nutrition. You need good food, clean water to drink, right? And enough of it. Um, not too much, but enough of it. 
Uh, you need to move, you need to exercise, which we'll look at here in just a few minutes. You need to uh, get enough sleep, which is ex extremely important, especially in this earlier stage, like as far as when we're growing and, and our brain is developing so rapidly. Um, and we need to breathe. We need to breathe well, get enough oxygen into your system, as well as actually enough carbon dioxide into your system for your, your, your body to function as it should. So those are the four pillars, basically, that make a good, healthy body um, and mind. All of those four elements, if they're all in place, everything will function better physically. So nutrition. Children and food uh, insecure households are more likely as adults to overeat when they are not hungry. And this is due partially because of conditioning, basically. Um, if you're not sure where, you're, where your next meal is going to come from or when it's going to come, you're much more likely to basically learn that when food is available, you should eat it. Right. Um this is actually an issue in a lot of countries that are moving from third world into first world, at least second world, or you know, up into third world or first world. Um, is they, they they go from a a state of poverty and food insecurity as being kind of the norm, to a state of comfort to some extent at least, and uh, and food being readily available, uh, and oftentimes that food becomes much more calorie dense. Uh, and it's there. So those are those are some tricky parts of this. And it's within one generation. We're going from, you know, parent, parents of young children now, like I say, like in India, for example, India is a really good example of this. Uh, parents that are having young children now were probably raised in a much poorer circumstance than they're living currently. And because of that, it changes their view of food. So in low-income family cultures, they, blah, 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 blah. parents tend to guard against undernutrition and rely on fast foods. Uh, so their children are especially vulnerable to obesity, specifically in the West on that one. Um, so yeah, basically we want to make sure our kids are getting enough to eat, right? And that's, and fast food is an easy way to do that. And so we get it to them, which increases chances of getting chunky basically. Um, interestingly, there's actually some, some, uh, they've done a bunch of research on how the different levels of income affect how we think. Um, one of the areas that they studied is how we approach food. And what they found is that low income people oftentimes, so if you come from a low income background or a lower income background. Um, you might have heard, did you eat enough? Did you get enough at the dinner table a lot, right? Uh, if you've had grandparents that grew up in the depression or that were very poor in the background, there's a really good chance that grandma you know, makes enough food for 10 times the people that show up. And she wants to make sure that you've eaten enough. I had a friend, or a girlfriend actually, for a while. Um, her grandmother was Italian. She grew up fairly poor. I go to her house and she was determined to make me fat. Like that, like legitimately that was her goal. But um mm -hmm. I would go and I'd eat, she'd have the best spaghetti ever. I'd eat four plates of it. And she'd be like, did you get enough? You need another plate. You're like, you look hungry still. I'm like, I'm about to explode, you know. Uh, but that's a common factor of if you have a low income background as a child. Middle class, relatively comfortable. It was, did you like it? Did you enjoy the food? Okay, there's the, the did you get pleasure from it basically? Um, and that's kind of the focus of the, the middle income where you're comfortable. Upper classes, typically is, how, what did you think of it? Um, did you like how it looked? Did you appreciate like the setting and everything? Um, which is why you go to a ridiculously expensive restaurant, you pay an exorbitant amount of money to get like, you know, a piece of food this big on a, on a plate and you're like, what the heck? Okay. Um, lower income, middle-class thinking goes to those restaurants. And you're like, why am I, why, you know, this is not enough food to fill me. I'm going to have to go home and get like a bowl of cereal afterwards. Um, upper class, you're looking at, it's not necessarily the quantity. It's not necessarily the flavor and enjoyment of it in that way. It's the quality that matters. Um, so different ways of thinking affect how we approach everything, including food. This is actually part of the reason why uh, there's a tendency for the wealthier side of things, uh, especially after a couple generations of being wealthy, to be a little bit thinner, um, better shape overall. So, um Sorry, a little bit of a sidetrack there, but it's on the same track. Anyway, many parents of overweight children believe their children are thinner than they actually are. When they're assess they look at their kid and they assess them, they're like, oh yeah, they're fine. Um, when in fact, they're very chubby, right? Uh, and that can be a, a challenging thing also is to, to, to really look at your child as they are. It's also a tendency to actually, if you look at your kiddo and you see them as thin, to not see them as thin as they really are, right? We always, we always assume that our kids are healthy and that everyone else is either too fat or too thin. Um, rather than looking at them objectively. Okay. Okay. Uh, something else that's going to be happening here with the nutrition side of things before I move into the next slide. Uh, the appetite will actually begin to decrease 
from age two to six. Uh, and it'll oftentimes come in waves. And so this is a this is a totally normal thing. There's gonna be times when your kiddo just can't get enough food in them. You're like, my goodness, you know, they eat like six meals a day. Uh, you know, or they like eat as much as I do sometimes, like with my little kids. Um, other times we can't get food in them to save us. Uh, that's normal, right? Don't freak out. A lot of like my parents and my grandparents are like, why are they eating? I'm like, it's because they're that's the cycle. Um, typically when they're eating, they'll they'll be sleeping a little bit less. And basically, you'll notice that they'll start to chunk up a little bit, okay, or a lot in some cases, but they'll begin to gain some body weight. Um, then they'll stop eating and they'll sleep more, and then that's usually a growth spurt happening. So basically, their body is getting to a point where it has enough reserves stored away that they can then grow. Uh, and then in that growing period, they'll eat less to almost nothing. It can be like frustrating as a parent. Um, they'll sleep a lot more, and they'll expand height-wise, okay. Okay. They also begin, they, they grow slower than they did when they were little tiny, and that's part of the reason why they don't eat as much and all that kind of stuff compared to, to their body weight. Okay, um, slide four, body changes, part three, nutrition. So weight gain in early childhood is fluid and may be influenced by parental and child care, dietary choice for children, right? Chubby, thin, chubby, thin, and it, they do it relatively easily. Um, Oral health are going to be a, a, a factor for basically, and it's a, it's a big indicator for all health. Um, so teeth are influenced by diet and health. Tooth decay correlates with obesity. Oftentimes the foods that lend themselves to obese, like the kind of diet that would make you obese, uh, is also very difficult on your teeth. It's very high in sugar and acidy foods um, that can be very difficult or, you know, rough on your teeth. Lots of, you know, soda pop or juice or, or, uh, you know, fatty foods and things like that. Um, infected teeth may indicate or create health problems, right? Anytime you have an infection and you're, you're, there's always going to be some kind of a health issue connected to it. That's what an infection is. You have bacterial issues or viral issues in some cases, generally bacterial, sometimes fungal. But anyway, um, if you got, if you have a, if you actually have an infection in your mouth, um, it can cause all kinds of problems. And so those are things to avoid. I mean, potentially like life-threatening problems if you don't get it taken care of, so. Okay, slide five, allergies, uh, food allergies. About three to 8% of all young children have a food allergy, usually to a healthy common food. Uh, so cow's milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, wheat, and shellfish are frequent culprits. Um, to some extent, corn is beginning to become an issue for a lot of kids also. They've been finding that there's a negative uh, reaction in their body. So diagnostic standards and treatments vary from, from place to place, culture to culture, even family to family, like what their expectations are. Um, but, and, and, and these, these, these allergies also are going to, uh, uh, you know, differ in, uh, severity. So you might have, you might be slightly allergic to peanuts or you might be have like a little itchy throat or something like that. Strawberries are actually another one that a lot of kids develop an allergy to, um, but there, there might be a little itchy throat or, you know, kind of things like that to life-threatening potentially where like, you know, you start to swell and it closes your throat down. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically a, a potential issue. One of the things that is a little bit troubling with all of this actually is that it is has been increasing. The number of allergies that children are experiencing is increasing um, over the last couple of decades, um, which is... A, a little bit troubling, right? Like we're, 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 we're beginning to look at like, why is this, why is this increasing? Is it the food? Is it something in our environment that we're, we're getting exposed to regularly? Is it something that's missing in our environment? Um, for example, they found that, that kids who are around like animals a lot more, uh, at, as small children typically don't have as many allergies, including food allergies as kids do that, uh, don't have that. Um, so we might be living in too sterile of an environment to, in some way, shape or form, um, where it's actually harming us. It basically makes our immune system hyperactive, which then creates an allergy. Okay. Keep figuring allergy is basically it, your body is reading a protein or something within the food. Um, in this case specifically as harmful as, as some, as an attacker. And so because that it attacks it, which causes inflammation in severe cases, rapid inflammation, which causes swelling and all those kinds of things. It's basically your immune system just going kill it. Okay. Uh, you know, in a, in a simple way of looking at it. And so we got a little glitch there. Hopefully I covered that. Okay. Slide six, uh, brain development, part one. Before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and give you the first random fact. 
So birds are the closest living relatives to crocodilians and genetically uh, the descendants of dinosaurs. So if you see a chicken, you're looking at a teeny tiny feathered T-Rex, uh, genetically speaking. <laughs> weird. Anyway, uh, when you actually look at a chicken running, you can kind of see it. And a turkey, maybe even like, you know, they kind of got that like trundle thing, like Jurassic Park T-Rex. But anyway, yeah, birds related to reptiles. We're closer to reptiles than dust, genetically. Um, all right, slide six, brain development part one, size. By age two, a child's brain weighs 75% of what it will in adulthood. Uh, so it keeps growing, right? It's going to continue to, to, to gain weight and mass. Um, I guess it's kind of sort of the same thing, but anyway, brain reaches 90% of adult weight by age six. Lots of growth happening in these few years. Um, myelin development contributes to the in this increased weight. So the, the, the size of the brain doesn't necessarily increase that significantly, but the weight does. Um, and this is due to the myelination. The myelination is basically, we, we remember we looked at the, I think we looked at the structures of the brain in here. At least to some extent. Myelination is basically the rubber coating. If you look at our brain as an electrical system, it, uh, if you have an electric cord, like an extension cord, you got the rubber coating on the outside to keep you from getting shocked. Myelination is that rubber coating, but in this case, instead of being rubber, it's fat. Okay. Uh, so the brain begins to basically myelinate itself. It increases the fat content of the brain in order to make itself more efficient. It keeps the electrical system firing the way it should, rather than going off into you know randomness, like a like a broken wire might. Um, and so as the brain basically myelinates, as it gains more of this fatty tissue in there, uh, it gets faster, it gets more efficient. It can, it, can, it can work through things much quicker than it did before, which is why there's a significant difference between a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old. You can see the evidence of this myelination occurring basically by how fast they can solve problems, um, their, their, their motor skills increase. All of these things are due to the fact that the brain is basically becoming better at what it does. Okay. All right, slide seven, and the pruning process is basically, it slows at this point, but it's still there. Our brain never stops pruning itself and it never stops creating more pathways. Okay, um, slide seven, brain development part two. From ages two to six, maturation of the prefrontal cortex has several notable, notable benefits. Prefrontal cortex, remember, front of the forehead, big ball right there that basically makes us what we are. We have an unusually large prefrontal cortex compared to the rest of our brain. Compared to the rest of our body, our brain is huge compared to our body, um, at least compared to all other animals. The only thing I think the only other critter that has a brain of similar size to body is mice, interestingly enough. But um, but their prefrontal cortex is not as as developed as ours is. Um, but with that development, you get more regular sleep. Right? They actually set rhythms. You're gonna find instead of just sleeping randomly, whenever they just get tired, they crash out, and then they're awake at random times also. Um, Emotions become more nuanced and responsive. You're not going to have just like simple blasts. You're going to begin to have these kind of intermixing of, of emotions and levels, right? Um, so now you can have slightly grouchy, maybe slightly frustrated to full on rage. And you have this whole gamut of potential emotion in between those levels of, of that negative emotion, right? Or what we see as negative. Um, so yeah, we also have happiness, slightly amused, full belly laugh, and everything in between, right? Uh, temper tantrums decrease or subside, especially if the parents are doing a good job with, with not giving in to them. Um, and uncontrollable laughter and tears are going to be less common. They still might occur, especially when the kiddo gets tired. When we get tired, even as adults, our prefrontal cortex actually loses a lot of its ability. Um, and in this stage, you're going to lose a lot. So emotional tantrums generally will be connected to one of two things. Um, one is they're tired, and the other is that they're hungry. Uh, low blood sugar can also have effects on the brain. And so those are two things. If, if your kiddo is like you know five, six years old, and they're throwing a big old tantrum, and that's not like their go-to thing usually, give them some food, or maybe see if they want to take a nap. Okay, or at least have some quiet time, kind of you know reduce the stimulation in their environment for a while. Okay. Slide eight, inside the brain, connected hemispheres. The corpus callosum is part of the brain that grows and myelinates rapidly during early childhood. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's basically that there's like a fin. If you look at the brain, if you look at a 
I actually got to, I got to hold a real human brain, which is pretty darn cool when I was doing my studies and stuff, but, um, cadaver, cadavers are creepy, but the brain itself was a fascinating, um, not really creepy, but it just feels weird when you're like, you know, this was a person at some point and now it's just a body. But anyway, there's a, there's a thick, thin, essentially that goes through the middle of the brain. Um, and it separates the left side from the right hemisphere, right? So you got two sides of the brain, specialization, all that kind of stuff. If you really want to get into that, take Psych 101. We'll, we'll look at that a little more in depth. Uh, but in the middle of that, there's a very thick nerve, very thick, like thicker than your thumb, um, that basically connects the two sides of the brain. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that's going to be where the, the, the communication occurs between the two different sides. It facilitates communication between the two brain hemispheres, which is exactly what I said. Um, and so with this, basically, this that's going to be where there's going to be a lot of concentration of this myelination. This, this, this efficiency boost is going to be built around that. Okay. What you're going to find, too, is that a lot of the neurons will move, well, to some extent move. There, there's going to be a lot more action happening around that central nerve uh, between in the corpus callosum to basically increase the speed that they can communicate with each other on both sides, right? Kind of like, I think I talked about this before, but in the old days, right, Pony Express, 1800s, late 1800s. Uh, if I had a business partner, and let's say I lived in New York, and had a business partner in San Francisco, and I wanted to get a message to him, the fastest I could get it there would be Pony Express, and it would take him weeks, right, to get from here to there. Riding ridiculously fast through ridiculously dangerous, and that's assuming he never gets there. The, the distance was a problem. So in the past, if you wanted to have good communication, you would generally have, want your businesses relatively close together, so that your businesses could actually communicate more rapidly, right? It'd be much easier to like step out my door, walk down one house and you know knock and there it is versus having to get a message all the way across the country. The brain does the same thing. It takes some time to get from one neuron to another. Um, and so because of that, the closer they are together, the faster that message can be sent. And so you're gonna find that there's the brain is beginning to cluster neurons that need to communicate more rap rapidly to each other, right? Our brain is beginning to form little cities in itself rather than just having kind of a countryside full of random things. Okay, so lateralization be uh, begins with genes and refers to the specialization in certain functions by each side of the brain with one side dominant for each activity. This is overplayed by pop psychology. Just a heads up on that one. Like, the, you know, are you left brain or right brain? Um, everyone is both left and right brain. Okay. Um, the lateralization and, it, and left brain is true. Left brain is going to take things more literally and right brain is going to be where the more creative things are. Um, which is like, so example, like a dad joke where the dad, like the kid says something and you take it way over literally. That's a left brain joke. Okay. Um, the right brain is the part of the brain that recognizes that you're joking and not like taking it seriously. Right. Person's like, I'm tired. And you're like, hi, tired. I'm, you know, Sam. Okay. Stupid joke, left brain joke, you take it literally. Right brain knows the nuances. That's kind of how our how our brain is gonna be functioning there. So there's there's specialization in this, right? Language actually is stored in the left brain. There's parts of the brain, if you can, you can damage it, um, it's kind of right in this area-ish. Um, one part, if it's damaged, you basically remove the ability to understand language. You could still speak, but you can't understand it. Um, the other part of the brain, you can understand it, but you can't get the code out. So I can't communicate with you even though I can understand what you're saying to me. Um, and if they're both damaged, then just you lose all sense of communication whatsoever. But, uh, but it's all on the left side of the brain. Okay. So this is kind of where that specialization begins to take place. You also have, remember, the left side of the brain actually runs the right side of the body and the right side of the brain runs the left side of the body. And so that, that uh, gets more and more you know, kind of entrenched in things. Okay, which brings us to right and left-handedness. Um, nine, left-handed child. So left-handedness uh, is shown in some newborns. Most people are going to be right-handed. Uh, that's just kind of the go-to, right? Like genetically speaking, we have a tendency towards that. Um, the the So there's there's some there's some different signs here that also we have we have a cultural favoritism of right-handed people, right? If you have scissors and you're right-handed, these scissors fit you perfect, right? If you're left-handed, they don't. Like it, it they're they're messed up, they got the wrong angles, right? You have to get special left-handed scissors. Or you get some just like, you know, ones that just have little simple holes that don't actually have shape to them. But uh, 
But that's we have a favoritism basically toward right-handed people because there is a tendency for more right people to be right-handed. Um, that's actually even shown in like the Latin terms. Uh, traditionally, right we have the, the word dexter, where we get the word dexterous, um, is from the Latin word for right, right-handed person. Um, the word sinister is the Latin word for left-handed person. It was somebody who was untrustworthy was associated with the left hand. Um, a lot of religions have, you know, like the good guys are on the right side and the bad guys are on the left. Um, that's a fairly common thing. And you're going to find this worldwide. There's a couple cultures that left-handedness is actually considered a positive thing. Um, but generally they're connected to warrior cultures where it can be a legitimately useful thing. Um, but because of that, there was a tendency, and there still is in a lot of places, to discourage left-handed use. Okay, So rather than being like encouraging someone to be a left-handed writer or, or painter or you know, whatever, um, they try to have you just shift over and do the right-handed thing. Uh, it is advantageous in some professions. Um, so yeah, if you can think of any, like mention it. But one of the obvious ones actually is sports. Um, if you're a left-handed athlete, most people are used to playing against right-handed athletes. And so by changing it over to the left-handed, and I know this from like combat sports and stuff in my own experience, um, I, I generally would fight southpaw, so left-handed. And people didn't know what to do with me because I was a left-handed and I was also exceptionally tall. So that combination just gave me like ridiculous advantages. But um, I was used to fighting right-handed people, right? There was one time when I went up against another southpaw, another left-handed fighter, and it was the weirdest experience because neither of us were used to fighting left-handed fighters, and it was just a mess. Like we, we all the moves that work really good against a right-handed person that like totally fake them out didn't necessarily work. <laughs> with him. It was a mess. But anyway, um, so sports are a good one, right? Baseball. If you're a left-handed uh, hitter, it's an advantage. The pitchers aren't used to it necessarily. Um, to some extent, even like golf and some different sports, tennis, uh, left-handed dominant. We we tend to to lean to push it that way. Um, because of those those factors, right? Hockey, if you're a strong left hand and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, slide 10. Um, impulsiveness and perseveration. Uh, so brain maturation or is innate, right? There's a, the brain just does this. You don't have to do anything to make your brain mature. It's just gonna physically get better, just like your body physically grows without you having to be like, think to grow, okay. Um, emotional regulation, which is learned, as well as connected to the brain maturation, eventually allows for most children to focus and switch as needed within their culture. They learn what's acceptable and not acceptable, and they learn to basically, they begin to insert these filters into what to say and not say, right? They're not good at it yet. Like a good example of this, when I was three years old, um, according to my mom, I, I don't remember this at all, but my mom said we were in the bank, was three years old, there was a very large biker type guy in front of us who had very long hair, and my only experience of, at three years old with people with long hair was it was a woman. Um, when he turned around, he also had a very long beard. And I went, whoa, look, mom, a lady man. Okay. Three-year-old brain, no filter yet. I haven't learned what's acceptable, not acceptable, right? Um, so, yeah. And I said it very loudly, as most three-year-olds will tend to do. So, uh, embarrassing moment for parents. But that's that would be an example of a... Uh, the lack of the maturation and emotion regulation, right? By the time I was six, I'd be much less likely to make that kind of remark. I might whisper it, be like, oh, what the heck, if I wasn't used to it, but I wouldn't just like blast it out the same way. Um, before such maturation, many young children jump from task to task and they cannot stay quiet, right? They're just kind of chattering, uh, nonstop talking, oftentimes is a, is a common factor. Uh, and they can't focus. They, they'll do this thing for a little while and they just kind of leave it and come and do this thing for a little while and just kind of leave it and then they're off here and then, oh yeah, I can go back here and you know, kind of all over the place. Um, that begins to fade. You're going to start seeing longer and longer play periods with the same game, same toys or whatever um, and they'll, they'll, they focus in on it. The story becomes a much bigger part of this. So other children engage in uh, perseveration, which is where you, that stick to um, You have one thought one action. In, in severe cases, it's where you can't quit, right? Lunchtime. No, you know, you've been doing that for three hours. You need to come eat lunch. No. Okay. That would be uh, perseveration in a long, in a strong sense. Um, they, at this point, it kind of fades to some extent and they begin to learn like, you know, it'll be there when I come back so I can go and eat lunch, come back and it's there.
unless a parent comes through and cleans it up without realizing they're supposed to. Okay, anyway, um, then you're in trouble. But, uh, slide, slide 11. And random fact number two. Uh, ladybugs have a unique smell that humans are very sensitive to. Uh, I didn't know this was actually a thing until I, I last year we had a big giant cluster of ladybugs for some reason to show up in our yard. And there was like a sweetish smell that came from them, which was the weirdest thing. So like, I don't recommend like putting a ladybug up because you might just like snort, snort it up your nose. But, um, but yeah, there's actually a smell that you can, you can like very lightly smell the ladybug. <laughs> Look like a weirdo. But yeah, I know everyone in the spring is going to be like, what? I'm smelling ladybugs everywhere. But anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Stress in the brain, slide 11. Relationship between stress and brain activity depends on age and degree of stress. Stress can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Uh, we all need stress. If you don't have any stress, if you're zero stress, like, okay, if you take a bunch of tranquilizers, for example, that would be, you, you'd be reducing your stress levels massively to the point where it can kill you, right? If your stress hormones are shut down, you die because basically your, your body relaxes too much. We need some stress. Um, in learning, we need some stress, right? Developmentally, developmentally appropriate stress will aid in our cognition. We're, we're, we're looking for a sweet spot. So like, for example, if you're, if you're learning a new skill, um, so I have, I have several weird skills, but uh, I'm a juggler, I, I, I'm a musician, I play a ton of different instruments. I, uh, I'm a fly fisherman. Okay, all these skills require a certain level of mastery to be able to do a certain thing. Uh, where you are learning, where you're really fully able to actively do it is where you're in the sweet spot where it's a little bit above what you're technically capable of, which increases your stress. You might be experiencing that in your classes as a student, right? Uh, it increases your stress slightly. But in doing that, basically, it's an, if, if it's not overwhelming, it's enough for your brain to be like, okay, this is important. Let's put more effort into it. And it increases your cognitive abilities. When you get too much stress, okay, so excessive stress hormone levels early in life may permanently damage brain pathways, especially in maltreated children. Too much stress breaks things. Basically, the brain will actually begin to, 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 to uh, scavenge itself. Uh, it cuts blood flow to specific areas. What you'll find is the prefrontal cortex is oftentimes shut down um, significantly. So there's going to be less control um, and less ability to make good decisions because of the stress levels in early childhood. Uh, the parts of the brain that actually will increase are the same parts of the brain that are kind of in the inner portions where you have the fight or flight responses and things like that. Those will be enlarged oftentimes. Um, so shrinkage of various brain regions and white matter is going to be a factor there. Um, so you, it, it, it can actually permanently, you know, it, it sets you back basically. You can kind of, to some extent you can overcome it, but you, you, you won't ever achieve your full genetic potential of what you had at birth. Okay. Um, but even in a small sense, like excessive stress, your brain all of a sudden is no longer learning and you're just reacting. Okay. Uh, and so, and so if you're trying to learn a new skill, right, you're trying to learn math. If you've ever worked with a small child with math, you can see this one very rapidly. If, if you're in that sweet spot, they'll engage with it and they usually like it, right? They enjoy it. You push them a little too far and all of a sudden they burst into tears. You've, you've just upped their stress levels to an excessive amount where they are no longer capable of functioning in that moment. Best thing to do when that happens, step back, take a break, come back, back up a little bit from where you were and take it, take another start at it. Um, yeah, in, in a situation where like the child is being maltreated, uh, there, there, there is a lot of stress just in their environment, right? And they might not be directly maltreated. Like they might not be being abused straight on, but let's say there's just a lot of, of, you know, negative emotions going on in a household, lots of yelling, lots of screaming at each other, physical abuse to other people. All of those things will increase the stress levels of the child, which then causes the, these long-term negative effects. These are some things to actually kind of keep an eye out for, um, even if there's not like physical bruising and things, right? Like the child's not being mistreated in that way. Um, but looking for signs of stress, if you get into education or into healthcare, uh, which a lot of you guys are, you're going to get in that way. Those will be some red flags that you're looking for 
um, when working with this age group and a little bit older even, um, are the signs of stress, right? Because uh, signs of stress can be signs of a, of a negative environment for the, the kiddo. Okay, slide 12, thinking during early childhood, part one. Uh, Piaget, so back to Piaget, you might be, you know, get, kind of keep it focused on him. Uh, Piaget and Erickson are going to be the two guys we're looking at. So Piaget, proper uh, pre-operational thought is what we're moving into in this stage. So pre-operational means before or pre-logical operations, reasoning processes. The child's verbal ability permits symbolic thinking and explains animism. Okay, I say pin, right? Uh, and probably you have an image that pops into your head. The fact that you have connected the word, the symbol, pin, with a specific thing, or if I say ball, right? Um, interestingly, I found that if you played a sport that involved a ball, there's a good chance when I say ball, that's the kind of ball you picture. If you played no sport, a lot of people picture a big red bouncing ball for some reason. So I don't know why, but that's the that's the tendency. Um, but yeah, I say the word ball. The fact that you picture this thing, that is symbolic thinking. Okay. Um, and it, it's, it's a big portion of what's going on here. Uh, basically, it, it, it's connected to our ability to now learn language uh, more effectively. <clears throat> Beyond that, the pre-operational thought. So that's the beginnings. That's the foundation of this pre-operational thinking, this, this, this um, symbolic thinking. Beyond that, it goes even deeper, right? Um, oh, shoot. I thought I had a flag here. I don't. Uh, if I were to show you a picture of an American flag, right, a kiddo begins to recognize that the flag is more than just a flag. It's not just a piece of material with like an American flag, red and white stripes and a blue square with some stars on it. Um, that flag represents something more. Okay. This is the earliest point when that begins to be, they're capable of understanding that some things have more power, more meaning behind them than just the thing in and of itself. Um, yeah, you know, so American flag represents the country of America, not just the flag. And so they'll see like, oh, that's for our team kind of a thing, right? The idea of teams, these colors represent our team becomes a thing that they're now capable of, of grasping. Um, so yeah, this is also extremely important to recognize when you're working with little kids. If you're getting in, again, if, if you're in education or psychology or, or, uh, medical field, um, uh, Logic and realistic thinking are not part of the equation yet, okay? To some extent it's there, but not very much. Um, symbolic and magical thinking are very much a part of this, uh, this stage. So to them, the, the understanding kind of what makes the world do what the world does, they're, getting, they're, they're continuing to ask this question, why? This is, this is the driving factor of early childhood. Why does that do that? What is that, right? They're trying to understand the world and what makes it work the way it does. Um, but they have a very, they have a much stronger tendency towards magical answers. When I say magical, I don't mean like, poof, there it is, you know, kind of thing. But just the, almost more mythological in their understanding of how the world works, right? Um, my, my, my four, or he's now five, but when he was four, um, I had a, my kiddo was asking me about how something worked, and I was like, you know, "Well, how do you think it works?" And he sat and thought about it for a minute, and he goes, "I think fairies do it, right?" Uh, we read a lot of fairy tales in our in our family, so that's there's a decent chance that's probably why he threw it in there. But that's kind of the thinking, right? They're going to come up; they they might not have an answer, and so they'll create an answer to basically solve how the world works. And this is what P Piaget recognized. Um, they're they're very kind of well actually interestingly enough the brain actually is, is firing when they when they do brain scans it looks similar to what an adult looks like when an adult is hypnotized their brain is actually working in a way that that um, takes in and absorbs information much more easily uh, but it also has a difficult more difficult time explaining things more rationally so okay that was probably enough on that section slide 13 <laughs> oh, okay we got a lot of slides to go through. I'm sorry. I got to kind of move things forward, I guess. Thinking during early childhood, part two, um, obstacles to logic. So these are going to be some issues that 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 uh, that keep us from thinking really well, right? The difference between a, an adult mind and a, and a small child's mind, these are some of those issues. 
Um, one is centration. And honestly, I've actually met adults. I don't think I've ever approved these. But anyway, centration is the, the characteristic of a preoperational thought whereby a young child focuses, centers on one idea, excluding all others. This is the way to do it. There is no other way to do it. Okay. Well, what about, no, this is the way to do it, right? Like I said, I've seen some adults that never lost this. Um, this this idea, though, this, 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 where it, this is just how it is and that you can't change it, right? Is, is a very difficult thing to overcome. Um, and it, I'll, we'll get to some more here in just a second. Um, when we get to like static reasoning and irreversibility, that's another part of it. Egocentrism, the young children's tendency to think about the world entirely from their own personal perspective. Their experience of the world is from their point of view, and that is all that they've ever had the experience of, right? That's all we've ever had the experience of. I cannot see what you see. I cannot hear what you hear. I cannot taste what you taste. We can taste the same food, but my experience of it and your experience of it may be different things. But I, at this age, you can't understand that yet. Okay. So this is the tendency that I assume my experiences are everyone else's experiences. If I like this, then everyone else must like this also. Um, if I think that this is how it should be, everyone else obviously should think that this is how it should be also. Because uh, I'm right and you're wrong, basically. Okay. Um, again, adults. Right, kind of look at yourself and go, hmm, where, how often do I still do this? Focus on appearance, character. Kids definitely judge a book by its cover. So do adults. But as adults, we temper it to some extent, right? Um, they've actually done research and they found that it's, it takes less than a second for a person to have, a, like your first impression, your very, very first impression is less than a second. So the first moment that you set eyes on somebody, in less than a second, you've already made a judgment call about that person. And if you're going to like them or not, okay. And then basically the next several minutes following that are are you're figuring out if your initial judgment was correct or wrong. Um, this this they don't do so much of the, the reasoning to figure out if the, it was right or wrong. They just make the judgment and they they stick with it. Ego or the, the the centration, right? So characteristic of pre-operational thought, whereby a young child ignores all attributes that are not apparent. If it's not obvious, forget it. Okay. Um, and that's what they're, that's, you know, that's just it. There's, there's no, like, they don't have nuance the way that an older child and adult would have in their thinking. Slide 14, thinking during early childhood, part three, obstacles to logic, um, static reasoning, the characteristic of pre-operational thought whereby a young child thinks that nothing changes. Whatever is now has always been and always will be. And if it does change, that throws their little world for a loop, which you can have a very big stress response from that. Um, that tied into irreversibility. So the characteristic of pre-operational thought whereby a young child thinks that nothing can be undone, a thing cannot be restored to the way it was before a change occurred. Um, is, it, this is the struggle. Okay. Um, so a thing shouldn't be able to, basically a thing is the way it always has been. There is no capability of change. And once the thing has this thing done to it, it is irreversible. It is unchangeable. Uh, your kiddo wanted a straw, or your kiddo wanted a sandwich with no lettuce. You put lettuce on it without thinking about it. They're like, "I didn't want lettuce." You'd open the sandwich, take the lettuce out, and they're like, "No, the sandwich is ruined." Okay, that 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 kind of like the the, the inability to basically see, or the the inability to see that the sandwich you can remove lettuce, and the sandwich is now a lettuce-free sandwich, um, is unbreakable. So yeah, it can become it can be. <laughs> It can become challenging if you're a parent of a small child, but um, and or if you're working with small kids. But keep that in mind. This this might help you kind of keep patience as an adult when you're just like, come on, you know. One way to do it is you can take the sandwich away, take the lettuce out when they're not looking at it, and bring it back, and they won't know the difference. But they'll be like, oh, good, you brought me a whole new sandwich. Um, so yeah, once you understand what what basically are, is blocking you, you can also learn how to basically overcome them. <laughs> oh, kids, it's fun stuff. Okay. Thinking during early childhood, part four, slide 15, um, conservation and logic. So conservation is the principle stating that the amount of a substance remains the same, i.e. it's conserved when its appearance changes. You can see this on page 167. They give some different examples. Um, I should also have a video. If you look in the videos, look for, for uh, I should, I'll have something shared that shows this in action, basically. Um, but an example of that would be like, if I were to take this, 
if I have something different that I could pour this, pretend like I'm pouring this into. If I poured this into a vessel that was, let's say, tall and skinny, I got nothing. Mm, I got a tiny weight right here. Okay. Tiny weight. Let's say this is a cup and not a weight. I poured this into this. Um, because this one's taller, you can't see that one's on the ground. Because this one's taller, uh, there's a tendency to think that the taller one must have more. Okay. Uh, interestingly, I, I, I might have mentioned before, I was a bartender for a while. Um, and that's one trick that a lot of bars will use is that they'll, they'll give you a tall, skinny glass. And it makes you think you're getting more because our brain still works that way. Right? We learn over time that if I, it doesn't matter. Like if I take two glasses, so in this example, they did this study. This is one of the, the, the things that Piaget did. Took two glasses of, of liquid. Um, he, asked, he asked the kid, is it the same amount of liquid? They say yes. Right? Like you make sure that they say yes. You take one of those glasses in front of them. You pour it into a, either a taller glass or a shorter, fatter glass. And you say, does it still have the same? And they say, no. And you say, which one has more? And they say, the taller one. Okay. Our brain still does that. Um, it's just we learn eventually that just because you change the shape doesn't necessarily mean that you change the amount of fluid. But we still assume that taller means bigger or more. Okay. Um, by age six or seven, you're going to have a, the tendency will be that they'll start to get that right. So if I pour it, they'll actually be able to explain to me that no, uh, this in fact is um, the same. Right, the, the substance hasn't changed. Another example I like to give it here is like cookie dough or play dough. You change the shape, you you change it. One interesting one, and actually we're going to go ahead and flip to the next slide, slide sixteen. Thinking during early childhood, part five. It has the the, the um, tests of various types of cons uh, conservation that you'll find also on page one sixty seven. Uh, one of the ones that fascinates me is, and I don't know if this is hundred percent true around the world, which is what I would like to see. If you take two pencils of equal length and you say, are these the same length? And they say, yes, or two sticks or whatever, like chopsticks or something. Um, and you move one of the pencils to the right, the pencil that gets moved to the right, the child will say is longer than the one that stayed still, okay? What I'd like to see, and I've never seen it done, I'd like to see if there's research done in, in countries where the reading isn't from left to right, if that still remains the same, or if in fact it is a tendency for because of how we are taught to read. Um, I don't know. Weird stuff. Okay. But this is also a good trick that you can do uh, with kiddos. Something else, size doesn't matter so much as much as, much as the number, right? If I, if I give one kid two cookies and I give one kid one cookie, um, you shouldn't do that. That's unfair, right? And the kiddo recognizes that's unfair. There's a, there's a basically like, hey, what the heck? If the kid is small enough, you can break the one cookie into two, give them the two halves, and you say, is this fair now? And they'll say yes. Okay, it's like a three-year-old, That's a, it works pretty well. I've got two, they've got two, we're good to go. Okay, um, they're not looking at size so much. If I give you one cookie and one cookie's obviously bigger than the other cookie, they'll think that's unfair. But it, but interestingly enough, when you break it, it works. Um, these are experiments you do with kids when you're a psychologist. But uh, so yeah, and it works. Most of the time, these things will hold true in this age group. Okay, and it's actually one of the signs that you moved into the next stage is that these no longer affect you this way. You you can see you're like you like you take the five candies and you you have five candies and five candies are the same, and then you spread one out, and the, that one has more candy now because it's bigger, it takes up more space. You recognize you're like no, it's still got five candies. You, at that point, you moved into the next stage. Okay, slide seventeen, thinking during early childhood, part six, Vygotsky. So Vygotsky, social learning. Um, he said that every aspect of children's cognitive development is embedded in the social contra cultural context. Um, we talked about him before, Robert Vygotsky's whole thing, though, is that what we learn is built on what who our teachers are and the culture that it's being taught through. So culture is passed on to our children through the actions that we teach them and how we do it, right? The little rituals of how to do a thing. So children learn from guided participation through mentors. Uh, which is why you'll have some interesting things. So mentors need to be uh, present challenges. It's going to be part of being a mentor, right? You give them something that they got to work through. Um, you're going to offer assistance without taking over. That's an important part. I see a lot of parents be like, let me do it. Okay, don't do that. Unless it's unbelievably difficult for the child. But offer help where you can. So let's say that there's a task that they, the kid's trying to do, but one element of the task is just above their skill level. 
Help them with that one element, but let them do everything else that they can, right? So maybe they can't tie their shoes yet, but they can put their shoes on, on the, by themselves. Let them put their shoes on by themselves. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, with this, the, the mentor will also add crucial information as needed. You're going to fill in the gaps, basically, in understanding. And then encourage and motivate them to keep on pushing themselves forward. A great example is this picture here. Uh, you'll also find it, that same picture on page 169 with the dad and the son uh, learning how to button shirts. It's difficult to button our own shirt. When you're first learning, you're like... You know, just trying to figure it out. Um, but it's much easier to button a shirt in front of you on somebody else. And so this is this is a, a perfect example of mentoring where the, the dad is basically allowing the son to learn to button the shirt while at the same time buttoning his son's shirt. And so that kind of gives him that, that connection um, as well as motivation to, to, to continue to do it. Okay. Okay. Slide 18. <clears throat> Thinking during early childhood, part seven, zone of proximal development, or the ZBT, CPD, there we go. Uh, okay, uh, Vygotsky's term for the skills that a person can exercise only with assistance, not yet independently. So again, I, I mentioned, you know, juggling, music, um, fly fishing, and things like that. Um, the zone of proximal development is, is, is that is that fine line, right? Uh, where, where it might be just above my skill level, but I can do it with a little bit of help, okay? Uh, which then can lead me to being able to do it by myself. Uh, and this is where the scaffolding comes into place, right? Uh, if I wanted to teach someone to juggle, right, I wouldn't just give them seven balls and be like, all right, juggle. Like, that would be stupid. I would, I would start with one ball, especially if I'm learning like how to juggle with like bean bags or balls. Uh, give them one ball. Have them throw it back and forth, get comfortable with it, then do two and teach them to actually get the crisscross instead of the, the circle that everyone kind of goes to because your brain freaks out because you've got something in the hand that the ball's put the land in. Uh, and then move to three, right? I used to teach small kids how to juggle, so that's a kind of a fascinating thing. But uh, there's it's steps. I could teach you to juggle. I could teach you to juggle three balls in one day uh, where you could successfully have, have some juggling going on. Uh, I could teach you to juggle four balls in probably a week. A week of practice. I could teach you to juggle five balls possibly in a month if you're really, really dedicated to it. Okay. I haven't mastered anything above that. I've heard it takes about a year to get to seven, and I, I haven't got there yet. But I, I just don't practice enough. Um, but yeah, so those are some things there. Uh, and I probably can't do five balls because I haven't juggled very much for a long time. We'll see. It'd be interesting. But um, anyway. So scaffolding is going to be the thing there, right? You, you start with the basics. I'm not, I'm not going to, if, I, if I'm teaching you math, I'm not going to throw you in the trig or, or calculus or something. Um, I'm going to start with, you know, these are numbers. Uh, or if I'm going to, you know, and so on, all these things, right? You're not going to throw them into the deep end. You're going to start in the shallow. So temporary support that is, uh, scaffolding is a temporary support that is tailored to a learner's needs and abilities and aimed at helping the learner master the next task in a given learning process. You build upon what you already know until you reach mastery. And then at that point, you still are building upon what you know. And that's kind of the difference between a master and a, an apprentice. The master has, the scaffold is, is huge. They have a lot to draw from, but they still have places to grow. Okay. Um, and this can become a, a challenging thing because as you get better and better, and we'll look at that as we get older, the better you get at something, all of a sudden you, ha you have a difficult time with finding mentors who are better than you. And so, so, you know, continuing to push yourself can become more challenging. Um, slide 19, thinking during the childhood, part eight. Over imitation is the, it's a universal trait. Doesn't matter where you're on the planet, you're going to find this to be the case. Uh, it's a tendency of children to copy an action that is not a relevant part of the behavior to be learned. Uh, example, my firstborn son was working on the car with my, my dad. So his grandpa. Uh, and at one point, my dad stopped and went, Oh, because his back was sore from leaning over working on the car. And my son stopped, looked at him, and went, Ugh, also, right? Apparently this Ugh, is part of working on the car. And so he, he copied it and did it. Okay. It's going to be common amongst two to six-year-olds uh, who will imitate adult actions that are irrelevant and inefficient. So this can be a good thing if you're very good at it, at doing a given task. Um, not such a good thing if, if, if you're doing a bunch of stuff that's not the proper way to do it. And you're trying to teach them. Okay. 20, thinking during early childhood, uh, part nine, language as a tool. 
So Vygotsky considered language pivotal, right? Uh, private speech involves internal dialogues when talking to oneself. Most people, there are some people who don't, but most people will have an internal dialogue where you talk to yourself. Uh, with kids, it's, it's generally out loud. With me, it's out loud. With, with most people, <laughs> with most people, it's inside their head. Um, and so that's a, you know, the, 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 you basically have this kind of conversation going on that walks you through the steps and things like that. Um, social mediation advances and expands understanding. Um, so th this is basically the, 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 the ability for a mentor to then use language to help push forward the individual's uh, skills, right? So you're at, that, you're at that, that level where you can't quite do it on your own, so I can talk you through it. I can help you figure out where you need to go um, through using language. And that's that's the key that Vygotsky found this to be the point, right? We need some kind of ability to communicate in order for me to teach you anything. Uh, if, if, if I wanted to teach you blacksmithing, you went out and went into the shop and you know set up the forge and everything. Uh, if I couldn't talk to you, I could still teach you through some level of communication, right? Well, I said that we spoke completely different languages. I could still teach you to some extent because I could show you it and I could guide you through it using like language, body language, basically. Um, uh, but I'd still need some level of language, right? I have to show you somehow or teach you somehow without language, without any form of language whatsoever. If there was no way to communicate at all, I couldn't teach you anything, right? This class would be pointless. But anyway, STEM learning is practical use of Vygotsky's theory concerns of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, education. Again, without language, all of these things are, are impossible. Okay. Especially the deeper end, right? It, when, when you start to get deeper in any topic, you need the ability to talk it through, to kind of give the nuances. Like I might be able to show you the nuances if it's a physical hands-on thing, but if I, what am I talking about? Psychology, right? If, if we don't have a, cap a good tool here to actually talk, psychology, I can't do anything with you with it. So I could maybe sign language, but a sign language is another form of language. Same exact thing, right? Just with your hands instead of your mouth. So, uh, yeah. Okay. 21, thinking during your childhood, part 10, executive function involves cognitive ability to organize and prioritize the many thoughts that arise from the various parts of the brain. Uh, this is where the cognitive, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex is coming more online. Okay. Prefrontal cortex is kind of like the, the, the master planner of the brain. So as it comes more online, all the rest of the brain basically gets uh, in line better. It's comprised of working memory, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control. Inhibitory control, inhibitions, it's the thing that basically gets removed if you get drunk as an adult, um, because it, alcohol affects the prefrontal cortex more than it affects the rest of the brain, interestingly enough. It's the first part of the brain that get negatively affected by alcohol. Um, but inhibition, so inhibition is basically disappear. It's the ability, it's the filter, right? The things that make you go, I shouldn't say that. Like people will find that offensive or people will get their feelings hurt. Um, or I shouldn't do this action because I'll get judged for it, okay? Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, but it's there. Uh, cognitive flexibility is I, you begin to move away from those limitations that Piaget discovered, right? The, the, the places that the brain is, they kind of stopped. Um, and I begin to see things from other perspectives, right? And I have the ability to see things from other perspectives. Uh, and then the working memory is gonna be a combination of your experience of the present moment tied into all of your past experiences to give you the experience of how to do things. It's the scaffolding process, okay? So it allows the person to anticipate, strategize, and plan your behaviors. Something happens, you're like, oh man, this something like that happened in the past, okay? pulling from the past into the present moment, and then it allows me to engage things, hopefully more effectively, uh, given that information, right? I can also make plans for the future. I can begin to come up with strategies on how I'm gonna to try to accomplish a given thing. All of that is now capable toward the end of early childhood. Uh, it relates closely to emotional regulation throughout life. The better, the better you are at these three areas, typically the better you are at emotional regulation, producing the right emotion for the right time and the right circumstances and the right level, that's the key part too. Um, slide 22, contrast between Piaget and Vygotsky. So Piaget highlighted the child's own curiosity and brain maturation and learning. His focus was on what the individual child was going through mentally, like the physical development of them. Vygotsky stressed that mentor, the, the role of the community, 
Okay, so the mentors, especially parents and teachers, and guiding the children's learning. The outside, basically, things that are shaping how a child is taking in information and what they're capable of. Piaget is looking at what is the brain physically capable of in like at that given age. Both theories recognize that young children are pro, uh, prodigious learners who strive to understand the world. That's the driving factor here. Kids want to know, right? Again, the question why, oh, you just hear it all the time. And it's important. You want to just answer it all the time if you can because uh, they're legitimately trying to fill in the gaps in understanding how the world works. Okay, so. Slide 23, uh, children's theories part one. So theory, theory. Um, theory, theory, basically children naturally attempt to explain everything they see and hear, right? They come up with their own theories about what makes the world do what they do. So they develop theories about intentions before they employ their impressive ability to imitate. Um, they see a parent or an adult do something that, they, that they're kind of imitating or wanting to do the same thing of. And they will fill in, they'll be like, I don't know why they did that, but I think this is why they did that. And then they'll, that'll become, this is why they did that. Okay. Maybe true, maybe false, right? We continue to do this again, to some extent, we're, we're constantly creating theories of why, and this is how you can misread people's actions and, and things. Um, we're constantly coming up with theories of why a person might do a given thing uh, and, and whether or not it's important or, you know, along those. So, so that's part of the theory theory. Okay, um, theory of mind. So this is slide 24, children's theories, part two, theory of mind. Um, person's theory of what other people might be thinking, right? It's an emergent ability slow to develop, but typically beginning in most children at about age four. And it can be seen when young children try to escape punishment by lying. You know this basically is turning on. Um, and this is, in a nutshell, what this is, is the ability to understand that you don't necessarily think exactly the same thing that I'm thinking. Okay, so therefore lying might work because you don't, when you come in and say, what happened? You legitimately don't, they suddenly realize that you legitimately don't know what happened. And so therefore they could fill in the blanks, right? What happened in here? Rock in the room is a mess, you know. Pirates came in and trashed the house. I tried to stop them, you know, they, they escaped out the window. Okay, big lie. Usually typically the lies at first are terrible. Um, but when you first see these lies, you'll know that now their brain is, they're moving into this theory of mind, basically. Um, this pers person's, person's theory um, of what's going on. Okay. Um, very rarely will you see this happen before age four. The brain just physically, for most people, is not capable of producing this kind of thinking until at least age four. Some kids, it happens a little later. Some kids just a smidge earlier, but it'll be close to four. Um, I've only ever seen it close to four. Like the earliest I've ever seen is just right before four, like a month or so before four. Okay. Before four sounds weird when you keep saying it. So uh, slide 25, children's theories, part three, brain and context. So the child's ability to develop theories correlates with the maturity of the prefrontal cortex and with advances in executive processing. Prefrontal cortex turning on, allowing the whole brain to work more, work better together. Um, executive functions lead to better understanding of false beliefs. Um, they are now able to realize that, that sometimes what they think the world works or what makes the world do what it does uh, isn't right. And they can reshape their, their view of the world. So context, experience, and culture are going to be relevant here, are going to be helping them shape the framework uh, in which they, they then build their view of the world. Okay. They're also beginning to understand nuances, right? From two to six, you now begin to understand that cool doesn't necessarily just mean cold. It might also mean interesting or neat or something, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So those nuances, that's going to be part of this, the, the brain's prefrontal cortex and able to understand things in how it is, where it lands. 26, a view from science, witness to a crime. You can find this more in depth on page 174. Um, this is a tough one, actually. So... On one side, younger children can actually be exceptionally good witnesses if they're handled properly. And that is the, that's the hardest part. I actually had a friend who is a uh, kind of friend, close acquaintance, who, who this was kind of their specialty. Um, younger children are sometimes more accurate than older witnesses who are influenced by prejudice and stereotypes, right? They, little kids don't have all of this role structure to, to base the information on. And so they'll try to basically give it just as it was witnessed as much as possible. Uh, they may confuse time, place, the person, and the action, which is tough. 
little kids are highly susceptible to influencing, being influenced by other people outside of themselves. And so because of that, uh, the everyone, all the adults that are around them can have a, a positive or negative effect upon their ability to interpret what actually happened. So it can develop false ideas from words, expressions, and scaffolding memories. Um, if you give me a room of preschoolers, I can get every one of those preschoolers eventually to think that all of their parents did something that they never did. Okay, and it could be exactly the same thing. I could say, your parents stole cookies. Okay, um, as long as the kid has some kind of a reference point to it, at first they'd be like, no, they didn't. If I'd said it enough times though, they'd be like, they did. You're right, okay. That kind of influence can be, is the one of the challenging parts here, right? Um, I can ask them questions that lead them to basically eventually saying that their parents steal cookies uh, without ever even, you know, and to them that would be the reality now. Um, so it's, it's, it's you got to be careful with this one. So may believe an abusive act is okay is if an adult says it is, right? You know, they, it's, just, it's just how they love me. Okay. Um, other tough things are, are wording issues. Uh, one girl that I, I, I knew of, she was, uh, she was working with a counselor. She, she had a lot of different developmental issues coming up. Um, and they couldn't figure out why specifically most of them were based around emotion, which was very much connected to stress and things like that. Um, and in this specific case, the, the family was apparently a very good family, not a lot of stress. And so they couldn't figure out why. So they, she started working with a therapist. She told the therapist that, uh, if I remember the story right, I heard the story before. Uh, she, she told the therapist that her uncle kept touching her cookies. And the therapist was like, well, that's kind of weird, but just tell him to stop touching your cookies. You know, like that's, you know, why would they do that? Well, later on, he was talking to the mother after several sessions. Uh, she was talking to the mother and the, 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 something came up and the mother referred to her, her, her genitalia as cookies. What the little girl was telling the therapist was that the her uncle was sexually abusing her. Okay. Terminology though was messed up. And so because of that, there was several, several months went by where they didn't recognize this was happening. Um, so optimizing witness effect, effectiveness, then that was a big one. They, they were actually help the little girl and they, you know, get everything cleaned up, but uh, as much as possible. That was a tough one. But optimizing witness effectiveness, reducing stress, especially toxic stress, um, it's going to be a thing. You want to reduce, if you're working with kiddos and who, who are witnesses to something, you want to reduce the stress as much as possible. Make them as comfortable as you can. Um, you want to balance arousal with and reassurance. Again, you want to keep, you know, keep them where they're actually focused, but at the same time, keeping them calm as much as possible. And then using appropriate interviewing techniques. You don't want to lead them. If you lead them, the kids are going to want to please parent, uh, adults. That's just what they do. It's, it's hardwired into them because that is a safety mechanism, right? If, if you're, you're much bigger and much stronger than I am, so therefore if you are health, health, happy with me, I am going to have a much better time in life. Um, and so they're going to be looking for cues that, you know, like the head nodding or smiling when they say something, you're like, oh, good, this is the right track. And they'll, they'll, they'll follow that track uh, even if it's not actually true. So the techniques here are, are it's tough. If this is going to be your specialty, it's a tough one. Um, but it can also be very rewarding because you can help a lot of kids get out of really bad situations. But yeah. Anyway, use from science. That's all there. Okay. Uh, page 174. You can find all that. Slide 27, language learning, part one, sensitive time. This is the sweet spot for language. Um, brain maturation, myelination, scaffolding, social interaction make for early childhood ideal for learning language. Basically, by age seven, you your sweet spot, like where you can really learn it, is from two or three to seven. Okay. After that, it starts to kind of get worse. Um, early childhood is a sensitive period or best time to master vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. You just pick it up. Uh, our, our jaw, for one thing, too, during this early stage, is the, the physical structuring of our jaws is still malleable, uh, more so than it is later. And so with difficult pronunciation, we can actually change the shape of our palate to some extent to meet those the needs of the sounds that we are hearing. Um, so it's a sweet spot. Okay, that's why when you get older, it can be more difficult to say make certain noises for certain languages. Um, 
where you get like like the stereotypes of like the people from China having a difficult time with the R sound, like rice. Um, the R part portion is not a common sound in Chinese. And so because of that, their palate doesn't produce it easily as an adult, if they learn the language as an adult. Okay. Um, okay, slide 28. I'm going to move a little quicker here. Language learning part two, vocabulary explosion. The average child knows about 500 words at age two, more than 10,000 at age six. Uh, it's impressive, like right, the massive jump there. There are some six-year-olds who can know up to 30,000 words by age six. Amazing, like the, the ability to understand language is just phenomenal. Um, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, conjunctions, many nouns are mastered at this point. They know how to pronounce it properly, right? They know how the words work, how you fit them together. And generally, they've never been like sat down like, here's how it works. They just do it because they picked it up from observation. Um, fast mapping is the speedy and sometimes imprecise way in which children learn new words by tentatively placing them in mental categories according to their perceived meaning. They think the word means this, they plug it in and it, and basically use it to see if it works. If it doesn't work, um, they'll readjust for it. Okay. All right, 29, language learning part three, logical extension. Um, this is very closely related to, to the, the fast mapping. Um, it occurs when children use a word to describe other objects in the same category. Uh, example is we had friends from Canada, they came down, they wanted to visit. At the time I had horses um, and they had a little girl and she wanted to ride a cow. I was like, you want to ride a cow? Like, we don't have cows. Like at the time, we didn't have cows. We had horses. I was like, we, you know, we don't have cows. We have horses. We, you, you don't usually ride cows. You ride horses. She's like, no, I want to ride a cow. And I said, well, why do you want to ride a cow? Because I'm a cowgirl and I want to ride a cow. And I said, what? Are you, what? And she's like, she points at the horse. She says, that's a cow. I want to ride a cow. Okay. Logical extension. She knew four legs. and It was connected to the word cowgirl. So therefore, that thing that is a horse must be a cow. She also pointed at regular cows and said, they are cows too. Similar category, right? Kids use a llama. They never heard the word llama. They know the word camel, though. That, that llama must be a small camel. Okay, that kind of a thing. So it, occur, uh, it, it, it becomes, it's a way of kind of helping to explain the world. It could be confu confusing for adults uh, who are more precise in their language, though. So bilingual children often code switch in the middle of a sentence, uh, realize which language to use by age five. My, I have another friend who lives in Italy right now, but... Uh, he is, he works for the the United Nations and he speaks multiple languages. He, I think he speaks twelve languages. Um, his son, by age four, was able to speak pretty well at least eight of those languages. So he could speak English, French, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, German, a couple other ones. It was crazy. At four, he would he would. Like if, if he didn't know the word in English, he'd throw in a German word or a French word or a Chinese word, and you're just like, oh, okay. By age five, he knew that I didn't know that, and so he was around five or six. Uh, he would basically only speak to me in, in English, and if he came to a spot where he's like, I don't know the word for that, he would ask. He'd look to his dad and say, you know, what does da da da, and he'd say it in a different language mean, and then the dad would give him the English word, and he would continue on. Um, that ability to code switch occurs early, early on. You'll also actually begin to see it at, toward the end of this stage, by age six or so. You'll begin to see where the, the kid will have a different way of talking when they're talking to their friends or siblings compared to when they're talking to their parents compared to when they're talking to other adults. Um, their ability to, to, to change their language and their approach to language, even though it's just the same language, uh, is that connected to that code switching. Okay. Slide 30. Uh, language learning part four, acquiring grammar. So grammar of a language, structures, techniques, and rules that communicate meaning. This was like my nightmare subject when I was in school. <laughs> um, I did not like grammar. I was, uh, you know, a slightly dyslexic, so grammar was just a nightmare. But anyway, still, I still hate grammar. I understand it better now, and I can kind of work with it more. I've learned how to get around that uh, way my brain works, but still, it's a challenge. Uh, Overregularization is the application of rules of grammar even when exceptions occur. Uh, good uh, version of this, right? Uh, a mouse. Now, actually, this doesn't actually work anymore. This used to work. One mouse is a mouse. Multiple mice is mice, not mouses. 
It doesn't work anymore though because computer mouses is actually appropriate. You, can, you don't say computer mice typically. Um, you have a foot or you have feet, not foots. Okay. Uh, those kinds of things are going to be the, the over regularization. There's a tendency because the S at the end of a given word generally means, and that's how most English words work. If I want more than one, uh, I put an S on the end, right? You have a dog, you have dogs, you have a cup, you have cups, you have a plate, you have plates. Okay. Lamp, lamps, uh, moose, moose. Okay. There's multiple moose. You don't have mooses, uh, or meese. So it, all of a sudden that one breaks. Sheep is the same thing, right? You have one sheep, you have 10 sheep, you have 20 sheep, right? There's there, there's no change in the word sheep. Lamb, though, is another one. And it really is connected to where we der derive those languages from, if it's from the, the um, Germanic languages or the Latin-speaking languages or the, the Celtic-speaking languages, uh, or English is a mess. But it all of that, because of that, is those little shifts in, in where we drew that language from, okay? That specific word from. Um, but yeah, it, we want it to be consistent and regular because of that we overutilize specific tools. And we might learn that that doesn't work anymore later on, right? You learn that a mouse and mice or a moose and a moose or multiple moose and things like that. Okay. Uh, pragmatic, so practical use of language, adjusting communication to audience and context. So words, tone, grammatical form, all those things. Again, we, that code switching where we know what to use for a given crowd. Um, a difficult aspect of language is it, to learn that, but it's already evident by age four. Okay. Uh, if you're learning the foreign language, you'll learn very quickly that like like tone and things is one of the hardest parts to really grasp. Like, how do I show what I want to show in this new language? Um, so yeah. Okay. 31, language learning part five. Before we go into that, here's the third random fact. Uh, the Marshall Matthews Foundation for At-Risk Youth was founded by Eminem. Not Eminem's like the candy, but Eminem like the rapper. Uh, so yeah, Marshall Matthews Foundation, At-Risk Youth, Eminem. There you go. Uh, okay, 31, language learning part five, learning two languages. Early childhood is the best time to learn a new language. So this is the period, if you want to learn more than one language, this is when you should do it. Like it's the sweet spot. You can do it later, much more challenging. Uh, for children to develop two languages, they must speak as well as hear two languages. And that's that's the important part, right? Um, there was a period I remember in the 90s when I was a kid. And they had like the muzzy videos or things like that. It was a weird blue monster thing that they, you know, he'd, he'd speak in different languages to try to teach kids how to how to, to learn these languages. <clears throat> what they found is that I could watch those videos all I wanted. And I'd pick up some of it, right? Sesame Street does this, like, you know, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, and all that kind of stuff. You learn how to like count because of songs and different things. Um, but you don't, because you don't use it regularly, and if the adults in your life don't use it regularly, your brain is like, this isn't really important, and so you don't learn it that deeply, right? Dora the Explorer, if you don't speak Spanish at home, if you watch Dora the Explorer, you probably picked up some words. You could probably count in it. You might have a you know a few phrases or things, um, but you're not going to be a master of the language just from watching those shows because you don't use it regularly, right? I was really good at, I finally got good at Italian um, and French, interestingly, back when I was using it. And I've gone years without using it and I barely know any of it now, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. And that's very much truth here. This is the stage that if you begin to use it and you use it regularly, it becomes a part of basically your, your memory bank. It is deeply stored where you can easily access it. So mastering two languages before age six seems to contribute to lifelong neurological benefits. The brain actually looks different for people who speak more than one language compared to the brain of somebody who speaks only one language. I'm like, well, poo. But anyway, if English fluency is lacking, language minority children often have lower school achievement, diminished self-esteem, and inadequate employment. Um, we judge ourselves by basically how we interact with others. If you feel like you are struggling, like if you stuck me in, I don't know, Japan, um, when I was a kid, didn't speak Japanese, right? Uh, I would basically be like, I am dumber than these other kids because I can't communicate with them. That's what my brain would tell me. Because of that, school achievement goes down, right? I struggle more. Um, Self-esteem goes down because you're struggling more. And as all those things come, it ends, ends up leading to um, employment issues later on. Or my self-view basically all affects how I am connected uh, later, how I interact with the world later. 32, language learning part six, language losses and gains. So language shifts. 
Um, becoming more fluent in the school language than in their home language. So if you're a bilingual uh, child, um, let's say you're in America and you originally speak Spanish, if that's a, in our area, that's a common thing. Um, as you as you enter into the school system and you begin to learn the language of, of you know the given country, so in this case English, um, you become more fluent in that. And in some cases, you get more fluent in that new language than you are with the language you speak at home. Um, and in some cases, you reject the language that you speak at home because you see it as inferior, even if it's not right. But it's that's it's this language is more important because it gets me in this. The home language is not okay. Balanced bilingual, which is what we're shooting for. If you're really going for this, is being fluent in two languages, not favoring one over the other. You're comfortable in both. Uh, and occurs that if adults talk frequently, listen carefully, and value both languages. If they're exposed to both of them constantly, they can get very comfortable in both languages. Okay. 33, language learning part seven. Five effective strategies for children of all income levels, languages, and ethnicities. Um, so code-focused teaching. Um, it's like, let me see if there's a, I think there's lists in here. Yes, you can find this list on page 180 with the more in-depth things. I'm just going to go ahead and read it off my notes though. Uh, so code focus teaching, in order for children to read, they must break the code from spoken to written words, right? Uh, it helps if they learn the letters and sounds of the alphabet. So an alligator, A, you know, alligator all around, or, you know, B is for baby and things like that. Okay. Um. Uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, so if you break the code, basically it makes it easier. Uh, book reading, vocabulary, as well as familiarity with pages and print will increase when adults read to children, allowing questions and conversation. If you read to your kid, one of the best things you can do for your kids' development is read to them regularly, specifically from books, um, not just from like tablets and things like that or your phone. Um, but introduction to it where they, they begin to understand, and this is actually what ended up eventually getting me to finally learn how to read. Uh, I was labeled with all these different labels as a little kid because I couldn't read and all these things, you know, right? I'm dyslexic and things. By third grade though, my mom read to me constantly, like every day, all the time. And it got to the point where I started wanting to read more than she was wanting to read. Um, she's like, you know, we're not gonna read right now. I'm like, but I wanna get the stories out of this book. And so because of that, I overcame my dyslexia to some extent, still a terrible speller, but I overcame it. Uh, in order to get the, the stories out of the books. So in third, late third grade, I finally was able to read. Um, and here I am teaching college, which is crazy. But yeah, <coughs> the, the, yeah, you can, you, reading to your kids is one of the very best things you can do for them. It'll also increase their vocabulary, especially if you read books that are slightly above where they are developmentally, right? Uh, so if you have like a four-year-old, you're not going to be wanting to read like Charles Dickens to them necessarily. But but looking at books that are slightly above where they are vocabulary-wise, and then they, when they have questions, like, what does that word mean? Stop and explore it. You know, tell them. Ho hopefully you know. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. My vocabulary isn't that good either. But, uh, yeah, you know, let's look it up then and, like, make that part of it. Now, read books to your kiddos. Parent education, three. So parent education is when teachers and other professionals teach parents how to stimulate cognition, as in book reading. Children become better readers. So if the parents are, are better educated in helping their kids, the kids become better at it also. Adults need to use words to expand vocabulary. Unfortunately, too often adults use words primarily to control. Don't touch that. Stop that. And those kinds of things. They don't use them to teach. Um, engaging your kids in learning and teaching is much more effective if you're wanting to help them with their language. There's a reason why most kids, one of the first words that they say is no, right? They've, been, they've heard that word a lot more than they heard in other words. Uh, four, language enhancement. So within each child's zone of proximal development, mentors can expand vocabulary and grammar based on the child's knowledge and experience. Again, reading books slightly above where they are, you know, it's, it's building upon their, their scaffolding. You're increasing their vocabulary. Uh, five, preschool programs. Children learn from teachers, songs, excursions, and other children. We discuss variations of early education next, but every study finds the preschool's advanced language acquisition, especially in the home, if the home, language is not the majority language. There you go. Okay. 34, early childhood education, part one, looking at preschool. So again, you can find that information on, from that list on page 180. Um, it can be a little useful one to kind of reference, especially if you have kids or you're working with kids. Um, okay, research on costs and benefits. 
Program research focused on children from low socioeconomic families, all provided intense education from well-trained teachers. Um, and there's, these are some of the different programs. Uh, Perry High School Scope Program, uh, Abbasidarian, and Child Parent Centers. All of these things were basically put into place to help uh, kids with kind of learning and, and you know, giving them a, a boost if they're from a, a lower socioeconomic family. Um, what they found, research on cost and benefits, this is slide 35, early childhood education part two. Um, the conclusion was that early education when done well, and that's the trick, it's got to be done well, results in benefits that become most apparent when children are in their third grade or later. So sometimes initially there's not going to be a big difference, like in a kindergarten class, right? And these kids are in an additional program. In the kindergarten, there's not going to be a big difference between the two. First grade, second grade, same kind of thing. There's not a huge difference. Somewhere around third through fifth grade, uh, all of a sudden you're going to see that these kids, compared to their peers who didn't go through these programs, who are from the same socioeconomic background, um, they begin to rise above them academically and in their vocabulary and their language. Uh, and so that's a that's a big factor. Okay. So it, it, it proved to be beneficial in the long run. Okay. Um, slide 36, early childhood education, part three. Um, international early childhood education. So currently in most developed nations, over 90% of three to five year olds attend school paid for by the government. Uh, more and more of the developed nations are, are, are offering free schooling basically. Um, could be good, could be bad. Honestly, it's one of those, education is really important, but at the same time, um, sometimes the state-run schools aren't all that great. But anyway, in nations where major government funding is scarce, preschools that are privately or religiously funded uh, proliferate. You're gonna find, like especially like in Europe and things, um, in the poorer countries, uh, like Catholic schools or Orthodox schools from the, the Catholic and Orthodox traditions of Christianity uh, will be the, the dominant forms of education. With the more upper class levels having private schools that might also be connected to some kind of a religious foundation. Um, Norway heavily subsidized preschool education for every child from age one forward. You're gonna find Northern Europe, when it comes to education, Northern Europe does things um, better than most, okay. Um, and their scores show that also. They're 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 uh, like Finland and things. They they generally score in the top three almost every year for the last decade. So um, let's see, thirty seven early childhood education part four home versus preschool quality matters. So this is going to be this is a tricky one, right? There's a there's a lot of debate on whether or not like if preschools are good and all that kind of stuff. Um, if the preschool is excellent, it can be a very good thing. If the preschool is kind of eh, it might not be okay. But if the home education environment is poor, a good preschool makes a very big difference. Um, it'll it'll help with their health, their cognition, their social skills. It helps with everything potentially. If though the family provides extensive learning opportunities, like if you're like super engaged with your kids, um, giving them lots of opportunities to get out and connect with the other kids and things like that, uh, that it's appropriate for their age, the 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 preschool basically ceases to matter. And in some cases. Um, doesn't help at all. So that, that is very much a spot by spot, place by place, individual by individual kind of a circumstance, um, family by family specifically, as well as the quality of the preschool. Like if you just have like an amazing preschool, it might still help you even if your family is incredible. Uh, most preschools aren't at that level though. Like that's rare. Okay. Uh, Child-centered or developmental programs. So this is slide 38, early childhood education part five. Uh, these emphasize, this is kind of an interesting one. So there's there's lots of different uh, theories of, of how education should work. Um, in the United States, we tend to kind of have a behaviorist model where we, we follow the, the, the works of B.F. Skinner and things where it's basically conditioning, right? Where we stick you in a desk, we do these things, and this is going to condition you to basically be the best person you can be for a given job field. Um, that's not the only theory that's out there, though. There's actually a whole bunch of them. Uh, so, so child-centered or developmental programs is going to be kind of the, the question here, right? Emphasize child-centered are going to emphasize children's natural inclination to learn through play rather than by following adult uh, direction. So, this is going to be things like Montessori, um, Waldorf schools. There's several other ones, but those, those are two that kind of mine off the top of my head. Uh, but the, the focus is on basically taking the natural inclinations of a child, giving them an environment that basically will. Uh, inspire the child to learn and giving them the proper toys and things like that that can be available and as well as just a good environment and then 
letting the child loose to some extent within that environment with guidance, but you don't have an official like teacher situation going on. Okay. So it encourages self-paced exploration and artistic expression, generally, and it shows the influence of Vygotsky, where children learn through play with other children with adults' guidance, and Piaget, which emphasis children will discover new ideas if given the chance. And that's going to be, so rather than behaviorism and Skinner, it's looking at Vygotsky and, and Piaget's thinking models. Okay. Um, slide 39. Early Childhood Education Part 6, Examples of Child-Centered Programs, Montessori, like I said, schools emphasize individual pride and accomplishment presenting literacy-related tasks. Uh, Reggio Emilia, there you go, that's another one, approaches a famous Italian early childhood education program that encourages each child's creativity in a carefully designed setting. Uh, and then Waldorf programs, which emphasize creativity, social understanding, and emotional growth, and they prize imagination. Um, if you ever go into these schools, they're generally beautiful, okay? Uh, I went to a Waldorf school one time and like you walk in and I was just like, I want to just be here. Like as an adult, while I was like looking at different things, it's like, dang, I like, this is beautiful. Like there's just, you know, natural art and things like with branches and trees and flowers everywhere. And everything was made out of wood, like beautifully handmade wood toys and things. Um, and like fine tapestries and it's, it's just gorgeous, right? Little gnomes everywhere and things. Um, and that's part of the learning environment. You, you give them a good environment and the kid wants to learn more is the thinking behind that. Okay. Um, so yeah, but then when these ones, the, the, the child then basically determines what they're going to do, right? I walked through a classroom one time with, in a Waldorf type of a situation and like there's one kid kind of sitting in the corner. I'm like, are they okay? And they're like, they're fine. We checked. They're good. They're just kind of decompressing. Okay. And they were okay with that. They didn't have to be engaged all the time. Other kids were doing art over here, and then you had some kids playing house over there, you know, working with tools and things, little like little kid-friendly tools. Um, you had another kid that was helping make bread. I mean, there, you know, just lots of different opportunities for for learning that's guided by the child rather than by the classroom. Okay. You can also look these up on YouTube. I, I didn't share any of these, I don't think, with on YouTube uh, on the channel. I might look at doing that, but anyway, if not. You can type in any of these names and you can kind of see the, the classrooms and what they might look like. Um, there's a lot of debate in the United States because it very it looks very different from what you'll find in a, a traditional classroom in the United States. Um, so because of that, they kind of are, people are skeptical of them. Uh, but these are going to be the ones that you're going to find a lot of times if you go to Europe, Northern Europe. Waldorf is a really common and Montessori to some extent also. It's going to be kind of the model uh, for Northern European countries. Reggio Emilia is going to be more of the southern southern parts of Europe, um, but they have proven they'll be very effective in those countries. Um, so yeah, something to kind of keep an eye out on. Slide 40, Early Childhood Education Part 7, Teacher-Directed Programs. Um, this is going to be kind of more what we do in the United States primarily, right? If you go to a public school, this is what you're going to be seeing. Um, they stress academic subjects taught by a teacher to an entire class. Uh, they help children learn letters, numbers, shapes, and colors, as well as how to listen to the teacher and sit quietly. I did not do well in this area. But anyway, uh, after are often influenced by behaviorism. Like I said, that's kind of the, the foundation of this is that idea of uh, conditioning models and things like that. And they're much less expensive since the child to adult ratio can be higher. So that's one of the big things, right? Uh, preschool and, and with, with this kind of format and then even older, like kindergarten, first grade, the classroom could be the class size can be significantly larger per adult. It was like, all right, kids, we're doing this project. Everyone at this table, you know, kind of a thing. And so you have like one one adult per ten kids, or or as you get older, it could be like one adult per thirty kids and things like that. Uh, which is very difficult for the teacher. The 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 other forms like the 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 Montessori and the Reggio Emilia and things like that. Um, you're going to a lot of times have like one teacher per three or four kids or per five kids because they have to have that kind of ability to interact with the teacher at a more, uh, in a more personal way rather than just in a classroom setting. Okay. Um, so yeah, a lot of debate on which one's better, what's best, worse, if, if one's better or worse, or they're just different, things like that. Um, I'll, I'll leave that one up for you to do research. If you're a parent, do the research. If you're into education, you might want to explore uh, some of the other forms of, of education, such as the Montessori and the like. 
Um, a lot of the elements of that can even, even if you're doing a traditional classroom setting, you can incorporate elements of those into it to help improve the overall environment. But anyway, all right, 41. Early Childhood Education Part 8, Project Head Start. Uh, it was a federally funded in the early 1960s to provide preschool education. This is part of President Johnson's whole war on poverty. Um, they, they, they linked it in. They looked at the, there was a big research. We are, Americans, we have wars on everything. War on poverty is one of our big ones. We don't seem to do a very good job with them. But this is one area where actually it did do a good thing. Um, what they found was that education was one of the key things needed to basically reduce poverty in the United States. Um, so federally funded in the early 1960s to provide preschools education for four-year-olds from low socioeconomic families or who had disabilities. This is the same area where you actually got the TRIO program. So if you look at campus at, P at, P at PCC, um, TRIO Student Support Services and, and uh, TRIO Upward Bound are two programs that help students. So if you're college age, TRIO SSS. If you're a high schooler, uh, TRIO Upward Bound. Great programs. Um, anyway, a little plug there. Uh, current goals shifted from lifting families out of poverty to promoting literacy, providing dental care and immunizations, and teaching standard English. That's kind of what the what Project Head Start does today, um, and they are effective. So the goal, basically, they're, they're, they've changed their overall goal from poverty to just getting the kids well educated and getting their health taken care of. By doing that, they reduced poverty in turn. Right? The goals, the official goal has changed. But they are achieving it through the actions of the original goal, through their actions that they're uh, rolling with. Slide 42, Early Childhood Education Part 9, um, Project Head Start. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, new of 2016 requirements include six hour days and 180 days yearly with priorities for children who are homeless, have special needs, or are learning English. Um, historical data suggests that most Head Start children advance in language and social skills, but non-Head non Start children caught up in elementary school, so they do get a boost, basically, initially. Eventually, the other kids are able to catch up that are in their same kind of category. Um, but Head Start children maintain superiority in their vocabulary, which is a big element there, right? Vocabulary is going to be formed for the most part. You can increase your vocabulary as you get older, but it'll be your, your foundation will be formed in that preschool, early, early school education level. Random fact number four. Okay. Uh, let's see. Chicken Run is the highest grossing stop action film of all time, even beating out The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, there you go. Chicken Run. That one shocked me when I first learned that one. I double checked and it's true. Up to this point, at least of, the, of when I made this video, um, that's, that's a true fact. Okay. Slide 43 and the last slide. Uh, of this video, opposing perspectives, comparing child-centered and teacher-directed preschools. So this is going to be uh, what you've seen in kindergartens today. You can find the same information on uh, page 188, where it actually gives you the article connected to it, or a little chunk of information connected to it. Um, into the 20th century, so look, look at like 19, late 1990s to where we are today-ish, okay, within the last couple of years. Um, so children should know alphabet before kindergarten, late 90s. Not a lot of teachers felt like this was an important, important thing, right? Um, like, so that wasn't a driving factor in preschool. Now that today, over 60% over of them say that they should. Um, children should learn to read in kindergarten. Again, less than 40% used to think that. Now today, 80% say that that's true. Um, children, children should be able to sit still and pay attention. 60% of people used to say that. Now it's closer to 80%. Um, that one really does depend on the child, but anyway. Uh, theater, acti uh, theater activities in curriculum, about 90% of, of schools would used to incorporate those. Today, it's closer to 50%, which is sad. Um, dance or creative movement, at least weekly, close to 60% used to do it. Now it's closer to 40%. Teacher-directed whole class activities, at least three hours a day, used to be less than 20%. Now it is closer to 40%. Um, reading worksheet, worksheets every day. About 25-30% used to be. Today it's about 45-ish, 50%. Um, math worksheets every day used to be 20%. Now it's closer to 40%. Um, I am not going to give you a judgment on that one. I'm going to let you kind of look at that and think, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And that's where I'm going to leave you. Okay. Don't forget to do the quiz connected to this. There's always two quizzes, right? You do the quiz connected to the lecture and then the quiz connected to the chapter. Um, two quizzes per chapter, basically. Um, 
message me if you have any questions. It's like always, hopefully everyone's going to have a wonderful day, week, whatever you're at in this. Um, and I will see you all in the next one. In the next chapter, we're going to be continuing on uh, in this age group, looking in, in uh, looking at the psychosocial development, though, instead of the instead of the physiological changes. So looking more at the, how the environment affects our development in this stage, looking at, at Erickson and the like. So have a wonderful day. You read ahead if you want to, and I will see you in the next video.